so in the interest of, of keeping on track and giving you the full hour's worth of uh, Dr. Henning Schultz for his talk, we'll start now and hope everybody can fill in quickly. Okay. Henning Schultz, who is, I will call, the father of SIF, and uh, who is a big advocate of, of all things public, public, providing the public with real-time communications, I'm losing my thought here, is going to talk to us now about networking research, a reflection in the middle years. This was a very, very interesting paper, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank, Thank you. you. So it's really great to be back. It's always one of my favorite uh, times of year to be uh, talking to a group of people, some of you I've seen for many years, and some of you it's always good to see new faces as well. Um, so do I need a microphone, or am I projecting? OK, all right, so this is working. It sounds like something is working. OK, so what I want to accomplish today is to do something that I I don't think we do often enough. I'm not sure I'm going to do a good job on that because it's a it's hard and because you know, this is my perspective. So it deserves, I believe, some other people thinking about it who may well come up with very different thoughts on the same topic. So if you don't disagree with anything I say, I've failed. I, if you find that you, I, I know. Uh, if you find that uh, you would want to explore an area both as a student maybe or as a younger professional or maybe even more so as a senior professional, I think it deserves that. And some of the discussion about technology that we had during the ethics panel is adjacent to what I'll be talking about, although I won't really talk much about that. So um, as Carol was mentioning, Ah, oh, well, here we go. Uh, this is actually a slide, slightly extended version of a paper that I wrote uh, as an invited paper last year. I uh, where a particular magazine, namely Computer Communication, had their 40th anniversary, and they solicited a bunch of people to write invited papers. And so um, I decided to focus on more of a, a one particular version of a reflection on more of a research focus reflection on networking, which obviously has a broader perspective. So you can read uh, citations and more uh, background there. So this is true regardless of how many years you have on your driver's license and whether anybody still asks you for your driver's license when you buy beer. Um, we're all getting older, and networking is no exception. And I take networking broadly it includes the kind of things uh, public safety, applications, all the way down to the physical layer. So anything communication and adjacent software functionality, I'm treating fairly broadly. Uh, anything that has communication as a key component, not just as a minor adjunct. And indeed, many of the things that uh, we think of as modern communication, so the communication that is internet dominated and all of that, has been around for many decades, and in many cases now is older than, and actually in almost all cases, is older than the students who I teach, the PhD students who I advise, the colleagues who I meet, and all of that. So uh, you see that by, if you look at the, one of the key conferences uh, in the field, uh, kind of a long-running communication conference, IEEE Infocom, uh, was founded in 1982. We've just celebrated 50 years of RFCs. I then sort of looked a little younger on that picture. I, that it was Computer Communications as a, uh, one of the early magazines, again, 40 years old. I, 1981, again, almost the same year, I, we had the early TCP specification. So they're all now kind of in the 40-ish year type of time horizon. As a side note, and that's also this is one of the sadder parts, is that we're starting to lose some of the pioneers in the field uh, that some of us know or have worked with uh, in, in that area. And that's also a sign that, I mean, the people who started to found, lay the foundations of the internet um, are passing on. And if, again, if you look at 
a kind of 25 years ago, even which seems like kind of quite a long time, you could actually argue that many of the things that we now take for granted had a foundation roughly a quarter century ago. As in, they look familiar, they kind of did in a much simpler form what we do today, uh, in, uh, but they had a, uh, a more than passing resemblance to what we have. So like, this would be in the early 90s, um, that we're looking at, roughly speaking. So we had Mosaic 1.0, one of the first web browsers. We had IBM Simon, which is this thing there in the middle, which kind of one of the first smartphones, we weren't called that, but that's what it was. It was a phone that had a uh, 160 by 293 pixel CGA display. It had a 2400 bullet modem. Uh, we had the Newton that some of you might remember from Apple history. We had Wi-Fi, as was called WaveLion at the time, as a predecessor version of that in that era. We had uh, webcams. This is one that uh, I operated when I was in Berlin uh, in that, a little bit a few years later, uh, and so on. And we had doxes starting in 1905 as kind of consumer internet. So roughly 25 years ago, almost all the components that we now take as common consumer goods were suddenly emerged. But again, these are within a few years where we had this Cambrian uh, evolution, evolution uh, that people have claimed for that. So that's now a long time ago. Right. Again, this is probably older than most students are uh, that maybe they were not born then. And for the first few decades, we actually had a reasonable why, and this is my kind of bit on a slide version, that every decade, starting kind of in the early 1960s, where we had some of the theory work by Kleinrock and others on queuing theory and some of the early ideas of packet switching. Then we had university prototypes in the 1970s. We had kind of production use in research, as in university, we're using it for stuff other than networking research, uh, for email and sharing papers and so on. We had the foundations of a long uh, list of foundational kind of protocols that are still in white use today, from network management to transport protocols to DNS. Then from the roughly the 1990s to the 2000s, we had early commercial uh, and residential um, versions of the internet, dial up often, but often uh, some DSL as well. Um, and we had the evolution of the voice of IP protocols, largely in the early to mid 90s uh, in that. And then from 2000 to 2010, uh, we had a bunch of more document-oriented XML and other things and SIP became popular in peer-to-peer -peer net hack and sensor networks and so on. From 2010 to 2020, I'm not quite sure yet what I will put there on uh, one of these days, but it is becoming less. As you can see, the foundational technologies decrease over time um, and more specialized non-communication technologies start to dominate. So that's kind of also an indication of a maturing of a field, namely that almost all the key components in the protocol space were developed in the 1980s and 1990s, early 1990s. And number one, and this is based on another discussion that I did at a 5G um, presentation just uh, weeks ago, was that we always talked about, because that's what we do, that's kind of one of the things that's ingrained in our um, kind of notion of what network progress is, that 5G, 4G, whatever, 10G for cable that they now have, is going to do enable new applications. But new applications are extremely rare. They almost never happen. So, a, it is probably somewhat dishonest to say that they are going to be one because the burden for that is extremely high. And B, that's okay. New applications don't emerge. They get better, that's fine. I, so video has been around in the internet space since at least 92, since uh, anybody heard of the M-Bone? Uh, see, a few people. Uh, so kind of multicast distribution of video of shuttle launches and stuff like that. Again, 92. And video obviously had been around much longer in terms of TV before then. 
Augmented reality is, goes back to remember all demo type of thing. We, on Ivan Sutherland and others uh, in that. So you had some version of that in that. Um, virtual reality, 1979 uh, was, is claimed. I have no idea where, whether it's true or not. This is just Wikipedia. IoT, uh, the term has been used and reasonably well defined in 1985. I talked about that a few years ago here. Uh, connected cars date back 20 some years to the OnStar General Motors diagnostic systems, which had some notions of connected cars uh, in, even in a very limited way. And games have had online versions since at least the 1980s. So all of these base applications, many of which get cited for 5G, for example, they've all existed in reasonably recognizable forms as in not just this is some kaleidoscope thing that has moving pictures. This is electronic delivery of that content since the 1980s or early 90s in most cases. Right? Like this is what's just one example, but the topic that I work on currently, I'm on IoT as a commercial product. It wasn't called IoT, but it was smart home. I dates back to X10 devices. Um, since 1978, I remember having one not quite as early uh, in my home uh, to switch some lights on and off, and I did pretty much the same thing that my smart controllers do today, uh, just using very simple protocols. Uh, so again, much better now in some ways, uh, although in some ways the old system was much more reliable and easier to set up, but the basic idea of smart home, for example, again, dating back now, 40 years. So one of the realization is that we're not doing Star Trek here. We are civil engineers repaving roads. It's important. Star Trek only gets you so far, not, but not nearly as far as a well-paved road, but it's just a lot more exciting to talk about uh, the Star Trek version of your life. And what has happened? And this is what I try to impress on our students when they take their networking course, that they really only four fundamental civilizational infrastructures uh, around. Namely, I call them civilizational, and I'm sure if it's not original, is if you're lacking any one of those four, you're definitely feeling less civilized, as in life is just that much harder. You're transitioning from daily life to camping. I, so water, energy, transportation, and obviously communication. And we are just one, as networking folks, we are just one part of that. But all of these infrastructures are largely based on extremely uh, high total investment. They don't get replaced all that often, if ever. They get refurbished, improved upon, kind of added on to whatever. They just don't get ripped out in that. I, and there are lots of interdependent components that have lots of societal impl implications, as in they implicate the public interest in very broad ways. So we should not be surprised that moving out of the experimental research phase that we are now doing civil engineering research. And that's a good thing. So we can also look at this as kind of a we are done. We've done the end of communication. Namely, we had the telegraph, which had text only as kind of the first electronic means of communication. The telephone, voice, and some text by base modem type of things. Uh, and then the internet is anything digital that's information translatable into digital can be carried across now. So that means there isn't the obvious gap that was drove the earlier evolutions that were, say, the post-internet. And I think that talk generally has faded quite a bit, uh, simply because it's not clear, while it was clear what happened in the first few steps, why you would want to do that, it's not clear why you would need anything beyond that subject to, I mean, if you don't do teleportation or something that requires fundamental new things. Another realization is that fairly early on, within usually about 25 years, or sometimes a little less, a new invention takes a shape that is quite recognizable decades later. 
So this is the Model T car. Again, it's not something you would want to drive, except if you're into antique cars. But it is recognized, has all the major components of a car, and indeed it could drive, it does drive on roads today. Or even more so, this is a 707, I believe, um, the one of the first commercial jetliners. If you don't look too closely, you'll think this is something you could land at O'Hare, uh, and it probably could. I mean, it would still function. Should you just that, and probably had a lot more space between your seats. Uh, in 1958 than you do now. Uh, so the food was probably better too. So again, not that nothing has happened in aviation since 1958, that's silly to say, but the basic outline of what we expect of a modern air transportation system has was very recognizable in 1958. And indeed, the other one is, and this is specific to kind of particularly integrated systems like the electric grid, transportation to some extent, and the internet, that interfaces once defined essentially don't change except for some really major disruptions. So the two-prong or what became the three-prong outlet was invented in the United States in 1915 and standardized roughly at that time. I'm pretty confident that unless we all switch to wireless charging at some point, that in 25th, I mean, in 100 years later, certainly we still have the dominant interface. And I wouldn't be surprised if 50 years from now, certainly, it still is the dominant interface, even though no good electrical power engineer would design a three prong outlet like that today for any number of safety reasons uh, and so on. Indeed, what has changed is the inputs the generation, and the outputs, namely the consumer side. This is a relatively famous uh, paper. I don't know, does anybody teach in a networking class? Uh, this is a, uh, a uh, Steve Deering, who worked on multicast and IPv6, IPv6, version uh, among other things, uh, presented this in 20, uh, 2001, so almost 20 years ago. Noting that the internet, and this is actually true for many other similar systems, has a narrow waste of a protocol one where standardization converges and below and above it diverges naturally. So that you have one interface, the IP layer, whether it's IP version 6 or 4, they're similar enough in performance uh, and behavior that they are somewhat interchangeable, but that you have this convergence and divergence kind of as you go up for natural reasons I won't go into is actually an interesting discussion to have. And indeed, and this is going back to uh, a topic that uh, some people, and I don't know if it's originally created the term that he created that, Tom Wheeler, one of the previous uh, chairman of the FCC that I worked under, uh, has, I think, a book called The Victorian Internet. Uh, it's essentially the telegraph. So this is the number of messages sent on Western Union Telegraph Company for the United States, so the statistics that the National Bureau of Economic Research gives you, between 1910 and I mean, 1870 and 1910. And you see exactly this extremely rapid growth, and I don't know the downtime, and it's less interesting in that. So we had a version of that type of communication infrastructure with extremely rapid growth on, in that from these, on across these 40 years. Another one that you learn when you get older, and this is true for engineering infrastructure as well, it always takes longer than you think. So this is a textbook from one of my uh, uh, PhD advisors, Jim Carose, and his co-author, uh, and was published first in 2000 uh, in that. Uh, if you didn't know that, this is the first edition of this textbook, you would still recognize this today. This is all the topics that we cover, with a few exceptions like ADM, ATM, ABR, congestion control, and a few others. These are all topics that are very much the, the content, table of content hasn't changed all that much to now the seventh or eighth edition of that standard textbook. Uh, in that. So that is a, a indication, and this is not untrue. I share this if you had a mechanical engineering or civil engineering textbook, I'm sure they have new editions since the last 25 years, but the edition 25 years ago, 
still probably has a vast majority of the content that we have today. Again, an indication that this is, again, almost 20 years ago now, um, that the foundations really have not changed a whole lot. This is some more uh, in that, again, uh, very familiar with all of these topics that every network engineer still needs to know. So I mean, the good part about that is we worry about in engineering education that we're going to teach people, particularly if it's more application close as opposed to foundational Maxwell type equation type stuff, that this is going to be outdated. Nah, not, not a problem in networking. Whatever you learn today probably will still be valid 20 years from now and a good part of your professional history, certainly, uh, you know. And standardization, this came up just recently in the morning discussion, is these are some of the standardization area for one of the first IETFs that I attended. Uh, and that, again, very familiar. Um, the topics haven't changed all that much. Indeed, the ABT working group is still around in one form or another, uh, and a few other working groups are still around as well. Change has occurred, but very familiar. I mean, if you time traveled back, you wouldn't feel out of place or vice versa. So why is there so little change in the internet? So if we had major changes in the last decades. For example, for the browser, we had WebRTC, HTML5, WebSocket, CSS3, uh, and so on. In the data center, we had SDN, I think this came up earlier today, heterogeneous computing, rack scale systems, accelerators, all of that. In access networks, 5G and DOCSIS 3.0 is probably roughly the last decade in that. In the internet, the only thing I could think of, and hopefully during the discussion phase, maybe somebody can add to that slide, is one major kind of infrastructural change is the Google-driven rethinking of transport known as Quick. Uh, kind of a weave organizing of a transport layer uh, in that. And one reason for that is, and it's not quite clear how that all relates, that we have in browser space, we've essentially have three major players, um, Google, uh, Mozilla Foundation, uh, and Apple, no longer Microsoft. The data center, we have a handful plus minus. Uh, in the access networks, we have a major wireless. But in the internet, we still have, broadly speaking, if you count all of those plus some, we have hundreds and thousands of participants. So it's a lot easier to get three browser vendors to do something than it is, or when a major, some major cable companies to do something, than it is to get hundreds of PSAPs, thousands of small enterprises, whatever, to do anything. Backward compatibility has turned out to be easy for web browsers. You can still watch that 1992 web page no real breakage uh, in that. Uh, data centers are local. What one data center does doesn't really affect what anybody else does. For access networks, you can divide by frequency, so you can have some legacy DOCSIS if you really need to, or some uh, CDMA versus 4G, 5G type of stuff. For the internet, the only thing we've managed is kind of a minimum feature set that everybody supports, TCP, HTTP, uh, DNS, IPv4, and all of that, which largely then defines what the capabilities are. And the in incentives are different, too. The browsers, at least largely, were driven by competition between browser vendors that has probably diminished uh, in that, but there's some clear advertising and other content issues uh, that drive that. Data centers clearly have a revenue perspective. Spectral efficiency, both for cable and for wireless matters. I want to carry more bits over the same uh, fiber or uh, coax or uh, air um, spectrum. And it has been somewhat more limited in the internet space. It's just not obvious that IPv6, for example, reduces your operational expenditures all that much relative to expensive spectrum or other things. Okay, so this is from a doc tool for some of you who know what that is. I'm um, one, I, in networking, the developments that were said is really implementations of networks. With the only one at the bottom, optical interconnects at the physical layer, a new one. This is not my slide. I, this is all implementations of networks, not actually new network functionality, new network protocols, new network algorithms uh, in that. 
And indeed, if we look at generations of technology, even in the wireless world, which has seen relatively rapid changes, generations of wireless usually last about 20 years uh, from beginning to end uh, in that. So this is for 4G, 3G, and so on. And there's an old saying, uh, mind, the future has arrived, but it's just not evenly distributed. Uh, and this is one indication of that. I mean, how long? This is the IPv6 adoption for uh, Google websites uh, from April, so it's, I need to update that. But uh, it's, I, it's slowly increasing, but it's roughly linear and still only at 24% for when a major uh, service provider has been active in IPv6 for quite a while. Uh, it just doesn't, is not equal, but we've worked on IPv6 since 1994, right? And, uh, and the standardization of the current IPv6 protocol was in 1998, which in case that me, you need the uh, algorithmic assistance here, that's 20 plus years ago. Huh? So we've only reached 20 plus percent uh, in, in 20 years. Huh? And basically had nothing until uh, roughly 10 years after the standardization was finished. Let me talk about a different topic. So the other one is that networks never die, they just slowly drop nodes. Uh, so this is, we are still doing faxes, fewer and fewer, but they still exist uh, in medical offices and others. In 2017, so 22 years ago, uh, the FCC CISRIC, one of the advisory groups, had to deal with SS7 protocols as being a major security vulnerability for existing networks. And we still have the phone numbers and IP4 addresses, and we'll probably still have them uh, 20 years from now or uh, 25 years from now. So again, the switch that's there, born in 1982, probably still does good service somewhere, and the phone companies don't seem to be in any hurry to retire them, at least some of them. Uh, so networks seem to have a really long lifetime, unlike many other things. I mean, who still runs a 1982 computer? Um, unless you're in a computing museum, you probably don't. Who runs a 1982 car? Again, unless you're in antiques, you don't. But we still run, a large part of the voice network still runs on, uh, at least parts of it run on equipment, which was at least designed in 1982, if, even if it wasn't uh, physically built then. So we have kind of an also what I call the inverse network effect. So the network effect we all know, we probably learned about in networking class, that the value of a network goes up by some notion of, uh, depending on whether you believe in Metcalfe's law or in Reed's law, or who knows by, that it goes up some semi-exponential or square type of thing uh, by the number of nodes. But what also goes up, uh, the difficulty of changing a network also goes up with the same difficulty. Nobody talks about that, but that's, I think, an inherent property. Namely, nobody has an individualized incentive to change, and it's coordinating gets exponentially harder as the number of nodes, participants in the network grows. So we've also, and this is something that I think we need to change our tune on, is we say, well, there was these earlier telephone networks and they're really complicated. SS7 is really complicated. And when the early telecom networks had piles of Belcor specifications that went along with it, just look at the list of the domain name service uh, RFCs, which there is one, namely there are 143 active RFCs on defining what is essentially a database lookup protocol which provides less functionality than SQL, right? which was also designed a few decades ago. Right? So all of those, so when we talk about a protocol, this is true in spades for SEP2, uh, then we're not really talking about one document, we're talking about dozens and hundreds of documents in that, and DNS is one good example, one reason why there's so few really complete DNS implementations at the server side. So one of the other difficulties, and this is, I think, been one of the more challenging parts for networking research, as opposed to more generally what I talked about networking, is that you have a kind of a notion that we don't really teach it quite like that, but there's an implication that people, that there's a pipeline, namely you 
PhD students and their faculty advisors, researchers at university, I mean, at, at corporate labs, particularly more forward-looking corporate lab, not just development type of labs, uh, kind of your old DA labs and other similar, I mean, more, more open-ended type of lab organizations. There's a notion you publish something interesting uh, that will be picked up by um, other uh, researchers, maybe improved upon, it will be picked up by some commercial organization, and within some reasonable number of years, it will turn into a product, a protocol, a feature, an algorithm in that. That model, I mean, this is not unreasonable in other disciplines. I mean, most drug discoveries probably go that way from um, medical drugs. I mean, many physics discoveries kind of sometimes go that way if you think of solar cells in certain sub-areas where there is indeed a not too uncommon path uh, between kind of academic research and uh, implementation. Networking, it's harder to see that. Uh, so the number of papers that you have as time goes to infinity, the impact goes to zero for each individual papers because the number of papers just keeps on increasing. Right? So in expectation, the impact of each paper is likely to be zero. And there's this one, if you look again back on past 10, 20 years, how many networking conference papers actually, many are highly cited. I mean, that's they're good work, they're really interesting work, but in terms of actual implementation, very, very few of those out of the tens of thousands of papers that were published. We talk about impact factor by citations because if we were to measure impact factor by real world impact, most papers would be a rounding error um, on. And that's just the way it is. I mean, it's not a reflection on anybody's lack of imagination or skill or whatever. Networking is just inherently harder to do that kind of impact. So this is a quadrant. I don't know if some of you have seen that. It is a so-called Pasteur's quadrant uh, where we have kind of on the other one, on one axis, we have a request for fundamental understanding. So this is pure basic research. You don't care what it's used for. Like Niels Bohr, understand the atom, didn't care whether you could do anything with that. Right? Good, bad, or indifferent. Then you had like Pasteur type of thing where you had uh, fundamental research, but this was driven by a particular problem. They want to solve a problem. And then you have applied research where you don't really care why it works as long as it works. Edison didn't care about photon emissions, didn't care about thermodynamics, cared about light bulbs or sound reproduction um, in that. That's perfectly fine. And most networking research probably is in that lower corner. And we have a conference one where you often guess at problems and try to solve imaginary problems. Um, because they follow in a particular kind of niche in that where you define the problem to make it interesting mathematically as opposed to interesting from an application perspective. This is an old slide that I've used over the years is that there's actually a number of things that have attracted a high amount of research um, attention. So quality of service still does, multicast, mobile IP, active networks, IPsec, security, IPv6 have attacked in the past that's largely passed, in that almost all of them failed, and I don't have time to go through all of those, for a number of reasons which were somewhat predictable, as in the same failure mode appears repeatedly. So I'll just highlight one of them, or two of them, namely that the initial gain of many of these technologies is very limited, as in if I deploy it and nobody else, I get no gain, it's pain for me, this is the IPv6 problem and the quality of service problem to some extent. And that the existing solution is much simpler and solves 80% of a problem and 20% can be solved by adding more capacity or some other relatively trivial, uh, just throw money at it type of problem or throw a next evolution of Ethernet speeds at it uh, in that. So like we have, not learn quite as well as I think we should that we, as we propose new things, namely, what are common failure modes among these type of technologies? I think you can extend that to some more modern ones as well. Huh? So almost 
One other kind of, I think, observation over 40 years is we've had, and we continue to have to some extent, this has faded a bit, um, but la latest one I'll get to, um, I think, is still the judgment uh, is to be rendered, but we've had a number of attempts to make the network layer smarter. We've tried to add multicast. We've tried to add quality of service. We've tried to add more security uh, to that. Almost all of those have not been always complete failures, but have not lived up to expectations, as in they became niche technologies. If served is used, but it's not dominant by any stretch. IP multicast is used locally, typically, uh, in that, but most of it, we don't use VM bone for watching Netflix. Um, we use CDNs, which are just application layer servers uh, with some DNS sprinkled on top of it. Uh, we use largely TLS for security, except for some really VPN type of stuff. Uh, we use other things for mobile for mobility. All of these things, mobility doesn't happen really pan out. So the one that I don't know if anybody here is an aficionado of that, there is an attempt to add um, smarts to what you could call the network layer, namely uh, it is called a content-based networking or CCN or information-centric networking, a bunch of related terms like that. Uh, which still seems to be percolating about um, in a uh, relatively self-contained research community uh, in that that may still happen. I'm skeptical simply because it tries to solve many of the same problems uh, and doesn't seem to have much of an advantage compared to uh, the existing solutions uh, in that, even if it's cleaner in some way. Right. So we've also had, and I've used this slide in a different context, We've also had the surprise that generations of networking in the wireless space often are marketed for one thing. Uh, so 4G in our context was marketed as internet multimedia subsystem largely, as when video calls on your smartphone using carrier services, obviously, and or for 5G, it's now low latency, um, ultra reliable low latency communication. Uh, what happened was something completely different. You know, largely used internet over the top applications for that, used different applications. And what we cared about was really the last column, namely how many dollars per gigabyte does it cost to transport the data. That's really what drove adoption, that drove consumer application, that drove consumer acceptance on that. Um, you know, so and I suspect that will be the case for 5G as well. So what makes the paper-to-product pipeline so hard? Like I said, even the most highly cited recent papers uh, have had very limited impact uh, on operational practice. I'm not saying there are none, but I mean, given how many papers there are, like at hundreds of citations, almost none of those have found themselves in product. I, the other problem, and this is somewhat frustrating, in other disciplines, there are lots of kind of uh, not Nobel Prize winning researchers who make some study on I mean, which kind of animal or plant fat makes you fat uh, or how you acquire, get a cold or whatever. They have a small sample set. They don't invent anything fundamentally new. They use well-established methodologies. If they are good, I mean, in the sense of they do solid work, get cited a few times, but they don't, under, they don't have the notion that they're going to revolutionize cancer care or something. But their studies are useful because they can now be combined as kind of facets, pieces of a mosaic where you can learn something about a difficult problem incrementally in ways that you couldn't by one big study or you would be too hard to do. In networking, we're not good at that. Most of the measurement studies are non-reproducible. Uh, most of the studies that we do for systems are non-reproducible unless they're made as open source. So this is uh, hard. And the usual problem is many papers have more authors than readers. I mean, that's a problem. I mean, hopefully the authors have at, re at least read it. Uh, that may not always be the case. Uh, and the other one is, I mean, you just publish a paper and you just expect to change the internet? Hey, let's be realistic here. So, no, this is not going to happen. But that does mean that the value of networking research, I think, has to be understood clearly because if you look at 
and this is a broader public policy issue, and this is starting to hit networking research as a side note, is a large part of why NSF and computer science gets treated very well by Congress for funding most of the years is they point to things like the internet as something, see what your research tax dollars at work can do. Well, most of the research that's funded by tax dollars today in networking probably isn't going to have that same impact, right? So one way that we should define networking research is it often it works in two ways, namely kind of standing on the shoulders of thousands of midgets, meaning research midgets like me, that do some small part of it and others do other small parts of it, and slowly that moves towards new understanding. Uh, as well as that much of the research, probably the most valuable thing that that paper that got published did, it taught a future researcher, PhD students typically, because they do all the work, it's just the faculty that get the credit, um, is that they learned research methodology. They learned to tackle a hard problem. They learned how difficult systems are to design, debug, measure, whatever they did uh, in that. That's probably the largest value of those papers. And they learn to give a presentation uh, at a conference on top of it. Right. And they're difficult uh, because you have this problem that the transitions that are defined are fairly labor intensive. So if you're lucky, you're a researcher and you work at Google, so you have a more direct or some other similarly influential company, so you have a more direct pipeline into product. That's a new version, it existed in some version, used to be Cisco or not. You get it into the Linux kernel. TCP algorithm is a good example of that. Uh, that has been a good mechanism. And you get it into uh, a um, RFC standard, not mean to get implemented, but at least it has some chance of that. All right. Those tend to be the real pipelines that happen, but they all require an extraordinary amount of effort by the individual or lucky employment relationship uh, in that not typical researcher type of activity because it just doesn't follow the same incentive model in that. So there's an old joke called the streetlight joke, which gets told every once in a while. Um, I, tell me if you heard it before. So this is the, the oldest version that I can find from my some old cartoon is I uh, have a cop ask, can't read it, I'm looking for uh, the uh, the quarters I dropped, he in this case, uh, the cop asked, did you drop it here? No, I dropped it down two blocks down the street. Then why are you looking there? Because the light is better here. It is the old, because you can actually do something there, you do research there. And that happens a lot with networking research. One classical example, and there's good reason for that. So you haven't seen it, this is the Orbit, Rutgers, Wi-Fi, Testbed, which is now a few years old. Uh, in that, but it's a good illustration of that. So you had 500-ish Wi-Fi access points, could access those remotely. They're easy to use. Web interface could be used by graduate class uh, in that. This is uh, the um, kind of LTE EPC specification. On the other side, try reproducing that in a graduate research uh, course. Good luck with that unless somebody did it for you. Uh, so. Not surprisingly, a lot more research on Wi-Fi, uh, relatively speaking, until recently and until well, my kind of physical layer stuff on satellite networks and that, just simply because it's a lot easier to buy a Wi-Fi access point, use it remotely, uh, then build your own EPC. There's another problem. Funding agencies, I don't know, who does NSF, who submits NSF proposals? A uh, few people. So one of the things that you know is there's two qualifications. It's called intellectual merit uh, and broader impact. Uh, so if you've ever been on a panel or whatever, and this is true for other funding agencies as well, they, you can't, your proposal can be as brilliant as when anybody can make it. If you don't show broader impact, the panel will reject it and should reject it. That's what I told you. Uh, in that. So agencies want broader impact, as in it should impact more than just simply be a smart solution to something or be a good conference paper or whatever, but they don't really want to fund it. Uh, 
what impact has largely become for those of us who know that you fund um, person, I mean, human development, uh, teaching underserved groups, all of that. Are they valuable? But is is not encouraged by, if you take broader impact of actually having the technology make an impact on the discipline or deployed practice, there's usually no money to actually do that. RFCs often don't count as publications. Uh, contributing to standards takes an extraordinary amount of effort. Um, and, and as Chris can attend to by his travel schedule, uh, and when he has fortunately corporate funder, doesn't have to rely on NSF, but it's no way that I can get enough travel money and time to actually attend all the standards meetings. That would really be needed these days to push through a technology uh, through the process. And that means that the standards contributions are largely, if you look at um, the, um, the contributions are largely corporate, there's very few universities on, on them. And the other problem is many researchers are defined by their methodology, uh, not by the problem. So there's a common theme, so you have a few things that have existed in networking for many years, so pathfinding, congestion control, and you have some scarcity of some resource, manage that resource, computation, energy, uh, bandwidth, some other type of human attention, who knows what, uh, we, and you manage that resource uh, in some way to allocate, create a better thing. So generally, and this is the classical one you kind of seen in other areas, that you have a time evolution of both the quantity of a resource, bandwidth in our case, and the population in, in, uh, in food. You have if those two curves intersect in a bad way, people starve. And so you have this Malthusian catastrophe where people will create faster than they can grow new food items, new food crops uh, in that. And we've had versions of that with video and versus bandwidth, but we've not actually reach that, although almost all papers predict that exactly to happen. Namely, kind of a classical version is my application, VR, AR, video, whatever, will add that much bandwidth, so we're going to re-engineer the internet because we add quality of service or whatever uh, to that. And the other one is that many people, and this is, again, not, nothing wrong with that because you need to specialize on something, tend to have a set of theory maths tools in their toolkit, and they keep looking for new applications of the same thing. It used to be Turing theory, then matrix methods became popular, and these days it's obviously machine learning. So you take a machine learning method, you find a problem along those, you do the intersection, and there's a paper. So just as an example, the term investigation of quality of service dates back to 1914. Huh? I'm in that. So this is as old as that, and it's probably not even the oldest paper, oldest one I could find easily in the IEEE uh, one. Huh? And we've done uh, tens of thousands of quality of service papers, won't belabor that here. I'll make one more, one major point. Uh, telecommunication, even though they like to think of themselves as telecom, as tech companies, telecoms are like, as much tech companies as we work is a tech company. I um, very much like to be one because the valuation goes along with it, but they're really more like airlines. Um, so the analogies that I draw are, if you think of the airline business dominated largely at a commercial airline by two companies, Boeing and Airbus, I, the uh, communication space these days dominated by three companies, or in the US, two, because you're not allowed to buy it from one of them. Um, and not so very small number of kind of whole infrastructure companies. Not that there are no other companies in either space. There's tons of suppliers, niche vendors for stuff that is not airframes, uh, so on. But the dominant kind of companies in both cases are very small, number of small. We had the Internet Protocol, I and mean, like I said, the Boeing 737, as we, and as Boeing, as we've all found out because of a 737 Max uh, debacle, uh, that was designed in 1967. The basic reason that we've had this problem because it was designed in 1967 um, for reasons that are no longer relevant, had to do with 
uh, airports and their lack of um, ability to have taller stairs to the aircraft. Uh, and the Internet Protocol obviously is not quite as old, but not much younger. And we have about 700 to 800 uh, airlines that are registered by IATA to fly around the world. We actually have about 800 GSM operators in the world, about the same number. Okay. Uh, so there are parallels between those. You can draw a few more that I won't do in interest of time, but largely in some sense is right. not that being an airline is easy, but United doesn't claim to be a technology company. They're an operations company. They operate equipment that has had their input. I'm sure they've been, come on, lots of uh, United Airlines people visit Boeing before they build a new aircraft uh, in terms of specification, but they're not a, come on, an aerospace company. They're an operations company. And, and this also leads to this kind of thing where it's an airline saying, we don't really want to be transport companies. We want to be movie companies. We want to be tech companies. Who knows what they want to be? I can understand. So the oldest theme, is any generation of wireless you see that, is we don't want to be bit pipes, is what the carriers say. The only thing they're good at is being bit pipes. They just don't want to learn that lesson. And the reason for that is bit, being a bit pipe is a commodity. Commodity is a good thing. We all need commodities because otherwise we wouldn't live. Uh, commodities are things like gas and oil and electricity and wheat and pork bellies. Those are commodities traded at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, and, but they don't want that. I know why. This is not an economic riddle. But the problem leads to all kind of bad behavior. It leads to all kind of misallocation of resources. Uh, and it leads to kind of Wanting to be cloud providers, content providers, it led to WAP and IMS, and it sort of often prevents them from good bit pipes because you want to hoard the application instead of opening up the network so that other people could build good multimedia application. You could only get quality of service if within the IMS framework. And the unfortunate part, and this is uh, true to differing degrees is that the telecom carriers don't actually really seem to believe that they want to be telecommunication companies. All the investments that they make compared to what they do elsewhere is content, advertising, whatever uh, they want to do. In some cases, it works out. In some cases, when you buy AOL uh, or Yahoo, maybe not so much. Uh, but it is a, man, that's where the investment is, even though but there's no natural similarity between people with hard hats climbing up poles and people directing movies. Doesn't seem to be any common intersection of skill set, but somehow companies believe that they have to do that. To me, that illustrates they don't really believe that networking is a future profitable business or something, or it's just more excitement, exciting to go to CAN than it is to go to uh, SCTE cable exposition. And the other one, I'm like uh, running out of time, so I'll uh, keep it here, is generally one thing that we learned is bits and bytes are much cheaper than humans. Uh, and that, namely, we focus as a research community on optimizing bits and bytes. But what we have not optimized is really the human staff that drives a lot of that. So operations is usually about 85% of what carriers spend their money on. They only spend about 15% on investment that changes over years, actually get lower now in many companies, it is in the equipment part, namely what most of the networking research tries to optimize, is 4%, 11%, again, this depends on the company, what you're doing, is construction, meaning laying fiber, people in yellow hard hats, okay, which we do very little optimizing. Right? Almost all of it, as I said, 85% is operations, very little of networking research maximizes operation efficiency. Uh, that's starting to happen, but it's kind of niche still in the network management area uh, as opposed to mainstream uh, in that. Uh, so it's starting to happen, but the question is which one will be autonomous first, vehicles or networks? Um, it's a question that I'm not quite prepared to answer. A few years ago, I would have said vehicles. That seems to be a little harder than 
other people like to anticipate it, but we'll see. I, on, it shouldn't be that hard. I, now, this has a job. The ethics issues come back up, namely, uh, what were people in Europe worry about that lots of people work for telecom carriers, and if you automate your network, you don't really need that many people. Uh, and good jobs, um, and, um, reasonably well paid, uh, interesting jobs in many cases. That's actually another aspect that we don't talk about that much um, as well. Uh, let me skip that. And I'll say generally, we don't do a good job as a network research community to actually uh, use dollars and cents or euros in our calculation because often those don't really justify what we do. Uh, I, and the problem that many of these changes that would actually make things better require a different skill set, namely a lot more software programming skill set, developing things in-house as opposed to just buying stuff. And uh, the carriers, generally speaking, I'm sure there are exceptions, have had a difficulty attracting top-tier talent uh, at cost. Because I mean, if you want to be programming, where would you want to work? At a carrier uh, updating SS7 equipment, or at Google, or at some whatever Bitcoin company, whatever the hot thing is of the day, uh, and just how to get good students interested in working for carriers, and there are other issues retaining people as well. Uh, no. Okay, and finally, we've uh, had a set of fashions and movements that, generally speaking, we drive certain things that are good, sensor network, machine learning, 5G, whatever it happens to be. We often overestimate, this is just some 5G, uh, related statements, because that's the hot topic in networking right now, from some US one. You can guess, I'll let you do the audience guess who the last speaker is. Anybody can guess? Okay, I'll, this is too easy. We also have a tendency <laughs> that certain network technologies are really, really popular. And as some of us who are older, we all believe that ATM was the future. We would all be running ATM networks. And now suddenly, I don't know what happened to this guy. Uh, nobody mentions a polite company anymore. Uh, textbooks don't mention history, basic barely mentions it. No, none of my students, PhD students, know about it. And even though they, but I don't expect undergraduates to know it. And we really have had very little reflection just, I'm just picking one example as to why that happened. In that. And it's monopoly game. I'll just, let me just get that. I'll stop here. So networking, some of you have seen versions of this picture, is, I, has a bit of an issue. Uh, that we have to deal with. Um, and now, the bad guy in the picture obviously in the middle. So that's the easy part. And let me just close here. Um, let me just talk one, I'll make one final point because it goes to the connection uh, to the ethics issues that we talked about, is in the first 40 years roughly of networking, if there was one constant that everybody, whether you believed in DQDB, one, one technology nobody knows about anymore, and ATM or Ethernet or IP or whatever, IPv6 or whatever it is, more connectivity is a good thing. That's no longer quite as clear. Uh, is, this is the, uh, the secret inspiration for the internet is uh, a way to reach a broader audience with my scribblings uh, in that. And I'll take another recent example is that, again, we look at kind of the public perception is the uh, Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, that's kind of independent one, the death of distance, uh, which was a kind of famous, relatively speaking, uh, book uh, and cover of Economist, uh, moving towards somewhat more skeptical view of that, or things like HN, where one has a hard time arguing uh, more HN would be a good thing. Yet now we're moving from a point where we used to take all the credit for technology, we are at least outside of 5G, 
we have to also accept maybe some of the blame that some of these technologies are indeed inherently abusable in that. And we see that happening, that restricting connectivity is becoming a theme. So after some really tragic incidents where people literally got killed uh, because of mobs um, and elections got blown, Philippines and other places um, that are closer by, um, WhatsApp, for example, restricts application layer connectivity, kind of a TTL for content uh, in that simply because otherwise the network is just too good at connecting and delivering information uh, that is generally considered harmful. Right. So we're not done yet. Um, unfortunately or otherwise, the internet has become like electricity as in you generally notice it when it's not around. Or the metro or in DC or whatever uh, your local transit system is, it appears in the newspaper when it doesn't work. So largely you don't get the credit, you only get the blame um, as in the operation side. We'll probably see somewhat limited operation on and I think the notion in 5G has to do so much about applications because simply telling people that it's now going to be whatever, one gigabit of speed versus uh, 100 megabits, just the excitement factor isn't doing it. I know cable is now trying, they are not good enough for 5G, they now have 10G, which actually means 10 gigabits. I'll we'll see how that that works. Um, do we finally get to self-managing networks? I think that's actually, despite some of the uh, hesitation I have because of the people affected by that, is network diagnostic is really still pretty primitive. I just, because I crashed, literally crashed my cell phone, I had to get a new track phone. Uh, I spent an hour last night with a, sales, with a tech, uh, tech support trying to figure out why SMS and data doesn't work. It involved a lot of rebooting and me looking at random screens. They still haven't figured it out. Huh? We should be able to do better than that 40 years in. And this is just, we can diagnose cause better than we can do networks. Uh, and it is also the increasing complexity of system makes it ever harder for researchers to have impact simply because reproducing and even understanding those systems is just really hard. You would have to spend a whole PhD just to understand 5G and all its components. Right? Just hundreds of hundreds of pages of really intricate stuff uh, in that. We don't know if we're going to see more upper layer services. Uh, we had peer-to-peer -peer storage now called blockchain. Um, wherever does that go, that seems to have faded a bit. Um, and we probably are ripe for some rethinking of the whole data privacy debate. Um, I'm not going to talk about that here. That deserves a much larger discussion, uh, namely, how do we get to a notion that is beyond just cybersecurity notions and others? And we'll largely see networks as enablers for things, not as an object of study in and of itself. Uh, that's just going to be what, until there's some major quantum type networking, maybe that will change things. But generally, I think that's what people will see it as. They'll see it as a tool not particularly interesting in and of itself. Um, so we'll have an amplification effect, as in networks can amplify the good and the bad, but we will have limited influence on the use end. That's a pretty scary proposition. We're creating, helping to create, maintain, run, operate extremely powerful tools. We have almost no control as to what they're used for, and we have been collectively as a networking research community really slow in anticipating some of the not so great uses for that. And we've been probably defending some of those things much longer than we should have, just natural human tendency. And with that, I'll leave you for lunch or any questions that uh, Carol still allows. Thank you so much.